prayer and get started. Father, how great Thou art. Lord, these hymns are wonderful, God, as they magnify Your glory. They magnify Your character. Father, we sang about the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can wash sin away. Father, it's not religion, it's not good behavior, it's not promises and pledges on our part to improve our lives. It is simply the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood is made efficacious for us the moment we believe. The blood does its cleansing work, Father, and we are made white as snow through that precious blood. So God, we worship you. We praise you, our God, who's, who's gone to such great lengths to redeem sinful and ungodly human beings such as ourselves. Now, Lord, we recognize we're in a spiritual warfare, a battle with spiritual forces of darkness, with Satan himself through his minions and, and his, uh, his obedience servants, the, the demonic realm, Father. And we ask, God, that you would help us to be better equipped to, to, uh, to stand in this wicked battle, this battle against wickedness, that we might stand against the forces and, and stand in this evil day. Lord, we're studying the breastplate of righteousness, so God, please make it clear to us exactly what that breastplate is and, Father, how to appropriate that righteousness on a practical day-to-day -day, uh, level. God, we love you and thank you for your holy word. Speak to us through it by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, <clears throat> this week uh, I am not going to go back and read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14 for the sake of time because I really do want to finish this segment today uh, and have the Lord's Supper before 6, 6.15-ish. So, uh, so what we want to look at is just kind of review last week. We're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. Now we're in this battle with spiritual forces and uh, Satan is assaulting us daily. Uh, <clears throat> if you haven't figured that out yet, it's very good to learn that because then you can start to discern things that are going on in your life and recognize, uh, you know, voices and, and impressions that come into your mind are not necessarily from your own heart. There's an enemy who wants to fire the flaming darts of deception and lies into our hearts so that he can cause us to be defeated. He wants to keep us pinned in this wrestling match, uh, the spiritual wrestling match, which does involve human agents. However, they're mere... Uh, human puppets that are engaged in, in the activity of the wicked one. And, uh, and so the assault is daily and it's on uh, so many levels, but it is a spiritual battle. We want to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might in this battle. And the way we do that is to put on the armor of God. Now, I've, I've already given this away. The armor of God is a synonym for Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm going through a series right now, an amazing study of the Word of God that talks about God giving his name to Moses. Remember that at, at the burning bush? He said, uh, Moses said, well, if the people ask who sent me, who shall I say you are? And God said, tell them that I am that I am hath sent thee. I am that I am. You know, Jesus is the great I am. He manifested himself, said, before Abraham was, I am. He took on the divine name, be revealing to be the one that spoke to Moses in the burning bush and the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, they understood what he meant because they picked up stones to stone him. They thought he was a blasphemer. Of course, he wasn't a blasphemer. He was, in fact, the great I Am. But God is I Am. What do you need? What do you need in your life today? God is the I Am, fill in the blank. And so we're going to see here that Jesus Christ, the great I Am, is our righteousness. And every element we see in, the, in this armor is another expression of the great I Am. And today we're looking at the great I Am as our righteousness. So what is righteousness? We talked about that last week. It is the character or quality of being right or just. And intrinsically, righteousness, God alone is righteous. There's no one else righteous uh, in their own standing. Whether it's the angelic realm or the human realm, unless God grants you righteousness or sustained the angelic host, He sustained them, so that they would not rebel with Lucifer. Righteousness is the character, the quality that belongs to God alone. He is right and He is just. Uh, now we want to talk about this other term, justification. To declare to be righteous, to pronounce righteous. And this is the foundation of our discussion on this piece of armor, the breastplate of righteousness. 
We must understand our justification before God, or God's declaration of sinners that they are righteous even though they're sinning. Right? And thank God it is that it's that way. He has declared sinners, he's declared the ungodly righteous by means of faith. Now the attack of Satan, we need to remember, primarily is to get us back under a works righteousness mentality. And really, that is the gravity, the pull of the fallen nature of man. What did Adam and Eve do from the very beginning once they sinned against God? They kicked into high gear. They started working in a religious system. They crafted for themselves fig leaves to cover their nakedness, right? They began to work to cover their shame, and that's what religion does. Religion gives you a list of things to do to try and cover the shame of your sin, and yet, just like Adam and Eve, you recognize that's not enough. Remember, they fled into the... They hid from God in the garden when God came in because they realized, hey man, these fig leaves aren't going to cut it. God's going to see right through these fig leaves. And that's why a religious man, and we talked about this in Sunday school, a religious man does not have any assurance of his eternal destiny. In fact, he has a gnawing sense of God's dissatisfaction, in fact, God's condemnation, even though he may be a very faithful adherent to his religious system. Why? Because... He's tried to cover his shame with fig leaves in the hope that God doesn't notice that. I mean, imagine standing before God and saying, Well, Lord, you know what? Remember those handshakes? I did. I shook hands 15,000 times. I counted and kept a diary. And God says, That's a fig leaf. It does not take away your sin. So <clears throat> Satan is always trying to get us, even as believers, to be under a system of works righteousness so that he can bring accusation and effective condemnation. And effectively making God a liar, that God, uh, that God does not justify by faith, uh, he cannot be trusted. This is always the, the standard attack of Satan. Mm -hmm. So last time we talked about, first of all, we looked at the substance of our righteousness. The substance of, of the means whereby God is able, judicially and righteously, to declare sinners as righteous. How can God do that? Well, first of all, we look at the fact that God is the one who justifies. Romans 8, 33 and 34, we read, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? A few observations. First of all, notice this. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And last week, we talked about how, the, how that word behind this phrase means to bring to account. Who is going to bring us to account? For our sins. Who's going to do that? Who in the universe has veto power over God Almighty? No one does. There is none that can do that. So the implied answer is there is no one who can lay a charge or call to account God's elect. Why? Because it is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? Notice the contrast between justification, declaring unrighteous, and condemnation, which is to execute judgment on the guilty. These are a great contrast. And in, in this world today, there are two categories of human beings. There are those who are justified before God, whom God has declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. And there are those who are condemned, who do not have the Son of God. They do not have eternal life. And they stand in their own sins condemned. They're condemned already, in fact, the Scripture says. They're in a state of condemnation until they believe upon Jesus Christ. But it is God that justifies. It is not your bishop, your priest. It is not yourself. It is not a religious code. It is a work of God. God justifies. God declares righteous the ungodly. Let's well, say that's good news, right? I, I, I want to know more about this. How does God justify me? I'm certainly a sinful person, an ungodly person. How does He do that? Well, let's look more at the substance of our righteousness or or our justification. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, we read that. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, or in place of Christ, where His representatives, His ambassadors, be reconciled to God. For He, God the Father, has made Him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, this is the standard. You must have not just righteous like, you know, Spicoli. 
people remember Spicoli? Yeah. That's righteous, dude. <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, you Janice shaking her head. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll get you a copy of Fast Times at Ridgemont High. No, we don't want to do that. <laughs> okay, we're talking, you must have the righteousness of God to get into heaven. How's that works righteousness doing for you? How's your thought life? Does your thought life match the righteousness of God? What about the words you speak on a daily basis? Do those match the righteousness of God in His speech? How about your behavior? Does it parallel the God of, the crea of creation? No, we fail in all points. But thankfully, Christ became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ. There's your key. If you're in Christ, you have the righteousness of God. This is the substance of of our justification, and it is by Jesus Christ being the sin bearer that we are able to be made the righteousness of God in Him. So the second thing we see is that righteousness, the substance of our righteousness, is by Messiah, Jesus the Christ. See, He is our righteousness, and His righteousness is the righteousness of God, and it was demonstrated. Jesus all the time would say, Excuse me, who among you convinceth me of sin? Which one of you can convict me of sin? And there was always silence. There was silence. But if I were to say that, all the hands would go up. Oh, I remember a time. <laughs> Don almost left the church because you did da 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 I know though, they, they left the church because you did da 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 You know, I don't raise my hand and ask that. There's always a, an abundance of answers for that. But, but Christ is righteous. He, and now He is our righteousness. So we, it is a work of God. Justification is a work of God. It is by Christ. We get more specific. Romans 5, 8, 9. But God commendeth His love toward us. He demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. We have a, a certain future, a certain hope, and that is we're going to be delivered from the wrath of God that's about to be poured forth on the earth, primarily, and, and then also in the lake of fire. We're going to be delivered. We are delivered from that wrath. Why? Because we have been justified, and who justifies? It's God. God has justified us, and we are now justified. Right now. Okay, remember last Sunday we went through this, and now here we are this Sunday. We've had a week full of, of ups and downs, emotional highs and lows. We're thinking about God, we're not thinking about God, we're, we're sinning, we're not sinning, we're resisting sin. All of the, the jumbled mess that is our life from that point to today, we can still say, being now justified. By what? By His blood. You see, we've got to take God at His word. We're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, that ransom price that had to be paid to the Father to redeem us, to purchase us off of the, slip, the sin the block, the slave block of sin. We are justified by His blood. So now we see we're, that is a work, justification is a work of God, not our work or religious work. It is by Christ, it's not by us. It is by His blood. Notice here there's no list of imp uh, behavioral improvements. Okay? Praise God, we're liberated from the bondage of works righteousness. Finally, in Romans 3.24, the substance of our righteousness or our justification. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, we talked about last week uh, the acronym G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. So we see here the justification that we receive is free. And that means what? That means in exchange for what? No, no, thing. no thing. Nothing. 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 Thank you. Very good. We are justified freely at no charge. By what? By His grace. So we see the union of grace and freely. They are inseparable. If it is by grace, then there is no obligation on my part to do anything to merit it. I simply thank God for it. I just simply acknowledge the character of God that He is one who gives freely. This is His character. And I just simply receive it accordingly. The moment I perceive the goodness of God is the very second I receive that goodness. And that's the essence of faith. And I talked about how last week, faith is not some other commodity that we, we work up in ourselves and exchange it for justification. 
No, faith is the epiphany that God gives it freely. I mean, once you get over the hurdle that how could God be so gracious to us? How could He be so good to someone, a sinner like me? How could He be so good? When you get over that threshold, that hurdle, and you realize He is that good. He is that gracious. It really is free. That's faith. That's the epiphany of faith. He extends that graciously to us. We're justified freely. Think of all the people under the yoke of, of, a, of a quid pro quo system. Quid pro quo meaning something for something. God, you give me the third level of heaven and I will give you, uh, you know, $58,275 of my income and uh, a whole bunch of baptisms for the dead. I'll give you that and you give me celestial glory. No, it's free. And if you pay for it, if you pay for it, you don't want to receive the wage that you deserve. Okay, the wage that you deserve for your sin. So justification free by grace, okay? Through the redemption. Now here's Christ's expense. God's riches, justification, at Christ's expense, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The, again, that means ransom. God ransomed us through the blood of the Messiah. Imagine that precious price. I, I was talking to Miguel earlier this week. And we were talking about giving blood. And I said, I can't even look at my arm. When they're giving blood, i got to look away. <laughs> or else the queeze happens and I might pass out. If I see blood flowing out of my vein into a, a vial that big. Yeah. Jesus Christ shed His blood. All of His blood was poured forth out of His bleeding body. As they punctured His side and His back was ripped. And the crown of thorns and the nails and the piercings of His flesh from the top of His head to the tip of His toes... He was bleeding from every part of his body and ultimately the spear that was thrust into, inside the chest cavity, rupturing his own heart and blood and water gushing forth out. Can you imagine being told that that's the ransom price that must be paid? And yet Jesus Christ in love said that it's worth it. It's worth that price. And so God's riches, justification at Christ's expense. Right? Okay, so that's the substance. It's a brief snapshot of the substance of our justification. Uh, now we want to talk about how is that appropriated to the sinner. Well, it's the word imputation. The, the King James word imputation. All right, let's look at this in Romans 4, 3 through 5. Uh, for what saith the Scripture? By the way, that should always be our question. What saith the Scripture? If you have a question about God, you say, what saith the Scripture? And you go to the Word of God and you find that out. Abraham believed God and it was counted. There's our word counted. It's the same word for imputation. Uh, it's counted, it was counted unto him, unto Abraham, for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So there are three locations where the word logizomai is used here, and it means an inventory. Okay? Uh, and it's in the word counted, the word reckoned, and again, uh, at the conclusion of verse 5, it, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's all the same Greek word. And, uh, and I've got a Bear with me as i got to look at my notes in my notebook here. Um, Logizomai uh, is, is to take inventory. Um, where did I write that down? In? Yeah, it means to take inventory, to esteem, to consider, to regard as, to reckon, to impute, or to attribute, or to ascribe. Okay, so God, the Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it, or his faith, was counted, was logizomide, as righteousness. Now we went through, I had the handout last week, um, if you remember the, the, the block, and God looks through, he inventories the heart of man, and if he sees faith, <clears throat> then that faith inventoried in that man's heart, that sinful man's heart, that faith is reckoned, it is inventoried in God's book as righteousness. So the question is not, have I, what, did I, was I a better Christian this week than I was last week? No, the question that we need to ask is, do I have faith in my heart toward the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Well, if you do, according to the Word of God, God counts or inventories faith. He counts that as righteousness. And as I pointed out last week, every other sin that is also in your heart, He doesn't reckon that. He does not count that. It's not in the inventory. You ever wonder how these Old Testament saints that were scoundrels, you read the New Testament, and as we, even as we look at Abraham, and this the chapter 4 is this, is this wonderful praise of Abraham for his faith and being fully persuaded. But if you read back the details of his life, he struggled, right, with faith. He struggled. He, he uh, Hagar, you know, Hagar was, a, was, was brought into the mix here because of his struggle with faith, what God actually said. But, but when God looks at Abraham, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. He believed God. So that is the essence of imputation. And that is how God uh, uh, transfers his righteousness, which is essential to eternal life, to an ungodly person by faith, by perception. So now, today, I want to um, focus on the new material. How do we put on the breastplate of righteousness or appropriating the breastplate of righteousness? Well, the first thing we want to see today, again, is the gospel. This is foundational to everything. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, Paul writes, I declare, I'm telling you something, I declare unto you the gospel. I've got news for you. It's good news, and I'm declaring it. Which I preached unto you, that is the method of transmission, it is preaching, proclaiming this good news. I preached it unto you, and you have received it, and wherein you stand. You see, we stand in the gospel. This is the exact same Greek word that Paul used in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 14, where he exhorts us to stand, to stand, to stand, to be strong and stand. Having, uh, having, uh, uh, therefore, uh, how, uh, well, I can't remember the phrase, but, but essentially we're to stand in the evil day. And so we stand by this grace communicated in this gospel, this good news, euangelion. So by which, by this gospel, also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, when God revealed Himself to Abraham, the message that God gave to Abraham was a promise. And it was basically a twofold promise. Number one, I will give you this land, all the land. You walk up and down, you measure the, wing, the, the, the north, south, east, and west, Walk through the land, it's all yours. And I'm, number two, I'm going to give you an offspring, a people so numerous that they'll be more numerous than stars in heaven. If you count the stars of heaven or count the grains of sand on the seashore, then you'll be able to count your descendants. Okay? And that was a promise that God made to an idol-worshipping pagan, uh, basically in the land of Mesopotamia or, or modern-day Iraq. And Abraham had this response. He believed that promise. He said, I'm down. He gave him the thumbs up on Facebook. He would have clicked thumbs up. I like that promise. I take you at your word. That's faith. Okay? And that faith, that message, when he believed the message God sent to him, when God spoke to him that message and he believed that message, God imputed that faith, counted that faith as righteousness. Now fast forward to today. The message that we hear as the church today is the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Jesus Christ was buried. Jesus the Messiah was raised literally, bodily, from the dead on the third day. Now, if you do not believe that, if you think I'm just here to improve my life, and this is kind of a fun place to hang out. It's, it's kind of low-key, you know, and not a lot of demand put on you and all that stuff, which is kind of a good way to feel good about myself. If you're here and you don't really believe that message, then you do not have the righteousness of God. You are under the condemnation of God. But on the other hand, do you believe that message? Is that message true? 
Did Jesus, the Messiah, is he really the Messiah of God? Is he really the substance of this entire book called the Bible? Do you believe that? Is that really who he is? Did he really die an atoning death on the cross, not for the sins of the world, but for your specific sins, your innumerable sins, the sins you can identify in your mind and say, ooh, I did this and I did this and I'm sh ashamed of this? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Mm -hmm. That he was buried? Do you really believe it or is it just a myth? This is our religious myth. Do you really believe that he was raised from the dead? If you believe that message, your faith is counted as righteousness. Now Abraham, God showed Abraham the future, right? Remember when he went and sacrificed Isaac? God showed him a picture of the seed that would come that would die, the son that would die and appease the wrath of the father and bring salvation to all men and then all nations would be blessed through Abraham, through the seed that came from Abraham. God showed him that when he went to sacrifice in obedience. He went to sacrifice Isaac as a picture of the cross. Remember what Abraham said? He said, uh, Isaac is like, hey, we got the wood, we got the knife, this is all good, fire, it's all good, but where's the sacrifice? God said, or Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb for a sacrifice. Well, later on, it was a ram that was caught in the thicket. It wasn't a lamb. And he sacrificed that ram instead of Isaac. So Abraham was able to foresee in the future the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Abraham was not talking about that ram that would be caught in the thicket by the horns. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the Lamb of God that would come. So God revealed to faithful Abraham. He opened his eyes to see prophetically into the future Jesus Christ. And now we share in that same faith, the same faith of Abraham. And God reckons that faith as righteousness. So for me, of course, it was the, that epiphany moment was at my dinner table at the age of 16. Now whether or not you remember the specific details of the precise moment that you believed is irrelevant. What is relevant is do you believe it right now? You don't have to remember how it happened. It can be shady, foggy. You might have been a little child that, that responded at the age of five or four or you know, through, younger. However God wants to reveal, He can reveal it to a child. In fact, it's the children that's the easiest to receive it. They're not jaded and callous. They believe. They trust. What matters is, do you believe it right now? If you believe the truth, the message of God, which is Christ crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, if you believe that message, God counts that faith as righteousness. Okay? So now, let's see, how do we appropriate now this breastplate of righteousness? I'll try to do this in 17 minutes. So here we go. I want to look at Romans chapter 4, verse 15 through 25. I'm going, to, I'm going to read through, kind of work through this, and then draw out some truths, some comparative uh, truths that we can look at Abraham and how he walked in light of the promises of God and how that can be appropriated or applied to us today. Romans 4, 15 through 25 says, Because the law worketh wrath. That's a good phrase to remember when you meet someone who says you need to repent of your sins and keep the law of Moses. The law works wrath. Why is that? Why does the law work wrath? Well, because we can't keep it. We break the law. Just like any law of man, if you break the law, it's going to bring condemnation to you. If you break the speeding laws, it's going to bring a ticket to you. <laughs> if you break it too many times, it'll take your license. If you keep doing it, it can put you in jail, or even a, a seatbelt. <laughs> If you ignore the violation of a seatbelt citation, guess what? You can go to prison. You can go to jail anyway, not prison. The law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Ooh, that's a good thing to know. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith. What is the it there? What's well, speaking of the promises? He's making a, a case here. God made a promise to Abraham, and that promise was received by faith, not by works of the law. In fact, the law had not been introduced at this point. It is a faith that it might be by grace. Notice the, the union of faith and grace. Why? Because faith is not a work, and grace is entirely of God. It's a unilateral kindness without anything in return, expected in return. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure. Notice here, the promise is sure because it's by grace through faith. 
Now, if it were, were based on merit, then the promise would not be sure. Why? Because we don't know if we'd keep the, the, our end of the bargain. In fact, we do know we would fail to keep our end of the bargain. I was sharing with earlier today, the Jews were, God was trying to show the Jews grace, that how grace worked and that they need to trust in the grace of God as he's leading them from Egypt up to Sinai. And uh, remember when the manna, they were hungry and complaining against God and God rained bread from heaven. Uh, it's, by the way, it's nothing for God to satisfy our needs. They're in the middle of the wilderness. He goes, oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to rain bread from heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay? I can do that. I'm God. Um, he gave a few commandments with that. Remember what it was? They could only collect an omer. And my understanding, an omer was just like three biscuits. Mm -hmm. I have to check that again. But it's, it's not like an American feast. It was like, you got your three <laughs> daily bread loaves here, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's your meal for the day. He says, go out, don't collect more than that. Don't collect more than an omer. Because if you do and you store it up, it's going to rot overnight and worms are going to get in it and it's going to stink. Okay? Uh, and then on the, the Friday before the Sabbath, you collect two omers. Okay? And the miracle here, the second omer is not going to turn bad and stink that day. If you do it that day, it's okay. On the, on the Sabbath day, here's the third requirement. Don't leave your tent to go look for manna because it's not going to be there. What the Israelites do. They couldn't even keep the manna laws. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna, well here, I, I think I'm going to want a little bit more than three biscuits tonight. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, well, I'm just going to load it up. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine that too? I am a little bit more hungry. I'm going to get a little bit more. You just violated the law. Right. You can't even keep the law of manna. And on the last day, on the, uh, the, 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 the Sabbath day, don't go out of your tent. To look for manna. Well, good morning, honey. It's time to go look for manna. That's what they did. They went out and they couldn't keep the manna laws. And he's giving them this, this, this experience so they will come to Sinai and realize, I don't have the righteousness to keep your commandments. I want to live by grace. Okay? So, so the promise is made sure when it's by grace. Because we can't do anything for God faithfully. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law or to the Jews, but also that which is the faith of Abraham, Jew, who is the father of us all, Jew or Gentile, whether you're under the law or you're not under the bondage of the law. It's to all of us. Okay? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Now, remember when God said this, Abraham had no children. But he says, I have made you a father of many nations. In fact, isn't that why he changed his name from Abram to Abraham? And he changed his name without any children. There was no tangible manifestation of this promise being fulfilled, yet God decreed it. I have made thee a father of many nations. Now think about it. Here we are, Gentiles in Ogden, Utah in 2021, and we're talking about this old desert dude named Abraham. <laughs> we're talking about him. Why? Because we're his offspring spiritually. We are the sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. Okay? So, before him whom he believed, even God, God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, this ties in with our justification, he declares us righteous even though to the naked observer it's like, you've got lots of sin, I don't know how you count yourself as righteous. Well, it's because God calls those things which are not as though they were. And once God decrees it, then it's done. Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. In other words, he took God in his word. God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham received that and said, I'm going to be the father of many nations. And that epiphany moment was faith, and it was counted as righteousness. According to that which was spoken. See, this is the harmony now. This is faith. According to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness." Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Now, the application here, uh, first of all, we want to look at uh, what it means to be weak in faith. Because there's some real good uh, examples here. We look at verse 19. Uh, it, it says that Abraham was not, the, he did, Abraham did not have these character traits uh, in him as it related to his faith. Um, it says, uh, uh, I don't have my, uh, he's tired, da, 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 da. being weak in faith, where was that? Who against hope believe in all uh, And being not weak in faith, and being not weak in faith, number one, he considered not his own body, now dead. Okay, so let's, I want to break this down and say, okay, what is a person who is weak in faith? And we're going to make this appropriation to our ability to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, if you're weak in faith, and now Abraham was not, and so I've taken these negative attributes and, and condensed them together so we can identify, what does it mean to be weak in faith? So notice what he did not do. He considered not his own body, now dead. The first thing we see about Abraham is he did not factor into the equation, the promise of God, his actual, tangible, measurable circumstances. His body was old. His body was emaciated. His body was dead in the sense of reproduction at that point. This man is at this point 99 years old, when the, and God called it the time of life. He says at the time of life, that's when you will have a son. Well, when was that? That's when his body was physically dead dead. It was not going to reproduce at this point at 99 years old. But he did not consider that. Um, the word consider means to, uh, to observe or behold fully. A huge part of the problem with the, the body of Christ is that we are constantly looking at things that we can see with our eyes. We're looking at the concrete material realm and evaluating the promises of God based on the input that comes in through our eyes. He did not do that. Now, if someone, if he were to say, Woohoo, I'm going to have a son! They'd say, Dude, have you looked in the mirror? He'd say, No, I haven't. And I'm not. Thank you. Um, but, but everybody look at me. You, there's no way you're going to have a child at this age. Well, it brings glory to God when a miracle occurs, and that's what God does. He's a miracle-working God. So, so he did not consider his own body. He did not look at his own body. That did not factor into his determination. Mm -hmm. He did not look at Sarah's body and the deadness of her womb. These are real facts. These were not, uh, you know, oh, he just had it in his mind, but she was really still fertile. No, these were realities. If, if, if Sarah were to have gone in for her annual physical and said, Doctor, is it possible I can have a child in a year? He would have laughed at her. And he, he would have issued some prim pro, right? Ladies, you get some prim pro. Your hot flashes, we got to get rid of that. <laughs> Ashley's not laughing. I'm not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't talking about me. Uh, uh, speak for your own self. You um, but he did not consider that, and that yet was the reality. It had no bearing on the promises of the word that God had communicated to him. He considered those things. He did not consider them. Now, here's the fruit of that. If we consider those things as Abraham did not, if Abraham would have, it would have resulted in a state of unbelief. He would have rejected the promise of God. Say, no. Okay, yeah, I heard a voice, but I, I must have been dreaming or had a little extra alcohol that night. I, 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 but that's not true. <laughs> It would have resulted in a state of unbelief. And the same is true for us today. If we examine our lives in light of the law, in light of our behavior, in light of Christendom, we will conclude, no, God, I'm not justified. I'm not. I need to get my act together. Okay? So he did not look at the things, the real things, the measurable things that contradicted the promise of God. And therefore, he did not abide in unbelief. And finally, the third step of this chain reaction of those who are weak in faith is they will stagger at the promises of God. What does the word stagger mean? It means to separate thoroughly, to withdraw from. Okay? So, so Abraham, if he had looked at his own body and Sarah's body and tried to figure out how 
these two old people were going to have a child who had not had a child together up to this point at 99, and I think she was 89 years old. Uh, for him to think, okay, now somehow we're going to come together and produce a child. It would have produced unbelief, and he would have staggered. He would have separated himself out from the promise of God. Okay, and this is, this is the chain reaction that still applies today for those who are weak in faith. And fundamentally, the weak in faith, they live their lives according to their eyesight. They live their eyes looking at their bank account saying, well, I can't do that because of my bank account. Looking at their life, oh, I could never go and serve God in that capacity. Oh, I could never do that. Oh, no, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm like Moses. I'm a stutterer, Lord. I can't go to Pharaoh. I'm a stutterer. You need to send someone a little bit more eloquent than I am. We're good at excuse making because we look at our material uh, surroundings, our circumstances, and we gaze at those things and then we evaluate the promise of God accordingly. Oh, that, that can't be. That can't be. And that's essentially how, that's, that's how the world operates. But that's a description of weak in faith. Well, let's look at Abraham now, how he was strong in faith. What did he consider? What did he behold fully? He beheld the promises of God. He had a one-track mind. He fed his mind on the promises of God. And all the other things slowly fade out. And you know what I realize is we have so many distractions in this world today. Our time is so segmented and fragmented through all the social media and the gizmos and the gadgets and, and the messages. You're driving down the road. You can't even drive down the road. Oh, there's a billboard. They want to communicate to me. What's that say? Oh, I better call that number. I didn't get it. I'll see it next time. Oh, what's this on the radio? Hold on, hold on. We cannot focus our minds on the promises of God. We do not abide and meditate in the Word of God. And because we play, made our material realm and our physical well-being a priority, the Word of God is now even secondary. It's like, yeah, if I get to it, I get to it. You know? But I'm going to do the important things today. You know? Which are uh, misprioritized. He did not consider his own body. Instead, he considered the promise of God. Number two, he was fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded. And that is a definition of faith. He was fully persuaded. He was convinced. And as I looked up the word convinced in the English, it means an overcomer. Uh, you've overcome. There's a debate, a contention. Is this true or is this true? One is true, one is false. I don't know which. I want to determine truth, and I have prevailed. I've proven it. I know now. I'm convinced. I've overcome. I know that this is true, and this is error. Okay? So he was fully persuaded that what God had said, God was able to perform. That's the veil of, of faith being lifted open so he could see that and perceive God in truth. He was fully persuaded. So when I go back to the gospel and I ask you, are you fully persuaded of the gospel? Are you fully convinced in your heart that that is the truth, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead? If you have that fullness of persuasion, and again, I'm not talking about some mental gymnastics where, okay, pastor said I have to be fully persuaded, so I'm just, I'm going to say I'm fully persuaded. That's how you do it. No. Are you fully persuaded of your own name? Yeah, duh. Okay, then you should have the yeah, duh moment about your justification. It's by Jesus Christ, duh. I'm fully persuaded of this. I became fully persuaded at the age of 16. I'm fully persuaded today. That's why I'm preaching this message from this pulpit today. Okay? Um, and finally, the result is he gave glory to God. He gave glory to God. In other words, he ascribed, he echoed back, he reflected the faithful character and the power of the God whom now he believed upon. He gave glory to God, and that's how, what grace does, is it causes the recipient of the free gift to give glory to God. Why? Because I have nothing to boast in of myself. I must glorify God who has blessed me by grace. Religion will always cause people to be puffed up with pride and they will slide that pride in and they will boast in their achievement, they will boast in their works because they are working for that. And of course, there's no glory to God. It's all to, to the religious man and his system. But when it's grace, you give glory to God. And that's what, that's what he did. Now notice this. this is, he gave glory to God. And this is a, a mindset that he walked in. He, gave, he ascribed glory to God. He walked with God. In fact, he was called what, the friend of God, right? 
You find that in James, and you find it in the Old Testament where Abraham was called the friend of God. And so, characteristic of a friend of God is they give glory to God. Okay? All right? <clears throat> so this is Abraham as an example. So quickly now, let's make application as it relates to the breastplate of righteousness. First of all, to be weak in faith as we walk and to not have this, this uh, armor on, to, be cons to consider and behold fully our daily impurities of thought and word and deed. What's your focus on in your mind? Do you sit there and inventory your sin every day? Oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. You know, there are times when the devil will hit me and I'll look back years to an event that I'm ashamed of and he will drag that back into the present and say, look at this, man. You are sick. Look what you did. Do you remember when you did that? Yeah, I do. Oh, you are sick. And I will come under condemnation and not realize it. It takes me time. Like, what are you doing? You're allowing him to assault you and condemn you for something you did 50 years ago that's under the blood of Jesus. It's gone. And, it, and you know, I share this, and it's the same thing. It's happened more than once in the same instance where I'm like, oh, that was terrible. And he'll get me, you know, souring on that and being discouraged. So weak in faith in that moment, I put my breastplate down, and I'm thinking of, I'm inventorying my sin. Oh, I've got to improve that. Oh, I've got to improve that. Oh, here I did it again. You know, oh, am I really saved? I mean, these are thoughts that I must battle against. I'm a pastor, and I battle against these very same thoughts, this assault. Welcome to spiritual warfare. Do we consider and behold our sin? And we do have it. It's, it's real. Just like Abraham's body was emaciated, that was a reality. But the reality is we've got sin. We're sinners. Anyone that we know has known us for more than 30 minutes or 30 seconds has realized that we're sinful. Okay? Uh, number two, do you gaze at your inability to stop the daily impurities? Have you recognized or do you sit there and stare at the impotence of your own will? Oh, I hate this character trait. I, oh, I'm going to... Okay, this week I'm going to make a... It's, okay, it's January 1st. I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to stop X, Y, and Z sins. And then I'm going to do it. This is the year I'm going to do it. You know what I used to do? This was me. The flesh would rise up. Because remember, my works were... I, if I didn't get an hour of Bible study and prayer in every day, then God was angry with me, right? I shared that last week. So here's what my flesh, my religious flesh would rise up and say, all right, oh, look at these markers. Yeah, I'm going to get these markers. I'm going to buy these. I'm going to get this book. Oh, yeah, and I'm going to, oh, I'm going to do this study. Oh, I'm going to buy this book. I'm going to read this book, and I'm going to highlight it, and I'm going to take notes and do all this stuff. <laughs> and you know what? That stuff would be thrown in a door. <clears throat> Maybe you used it one time. Mm -hmm. And then failure. I didn't even have the will to consistently do a Bible study for a week. Okay? Now, I do have many notebooks now filled with notes and everything, but it's no longer under a legalistic system of pure, raw will. I will have a devotion. I will serve God, and He will be happy with me. Okay? You're under religious flesh, and you're going to bring in condemnation. Okay? Thank God, He's not. I mentioned where He's not angry. We're justified. We're declared righteous. What does he have to be angry with me? Well, that thing you just did. Oh, that's the devil. See, it's not God. That's the devil's voice. Okay? So we're weak in faith when we look at our impurities, we meditate on our weaknesses, and we focus on our inability to stop sinning. Our will is weak. We can't do it. Read Romans 7. You want to see that in play? With an apostle, mind you. Uh, that's Romans 7. Number two, we fall into unbelief. Denial, a, 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 an intuitive, uh, instinctive denial of the doctrines of imputation. You see, when he gets you moved over to that behavior performance, then you have shifted your mind into unbelief and you are subtly, subconsciously denying this doctrine of imputation. <coughs> But if I challenge you and say, do you believe in the imputation of righteousness? Oh, yes, I do, Pastor. Absolutely. Amen. It's in Romans chapter 4. Beautiful. But in practice, you see, when you leave church, see, the devil's waiting outside both doors. When you leave church today, you go, wasn't that a good sermon? Yeah, it was. Here, let me put this jacket on you. And it's works righteousness. It's chilly out there today. Let's put this coat back on. Now back into your real world of condemnation and guilt and despair. <coughs> 
Because he says, oh, you need to take that heavy breastplate off. Leave that there. i got a nice jacket for you. He replaces it. And then we go into condemnation. So unbelief, and then we stagger. The phase of staggering. We separate thoroughly from or withdraw from the doctrines of grace. We separate from it because we've been... We've been attacked, assaulted, and now we believe we've shifted back into works righteousness, and therefore we stagger away from, from grace. We leave, we abandon justification by faith, not formally, but on a practical level. We embrace what? Self-help. We embrace... Listen, if you're a believer in this church, and you listen to the messages here, and you read the Bible, and then you go home... Well, that was really good. I'm going to pop in some Tony Robbins now. I want to hear some Tony <laughs> Robbins. I want, to, I want to make something of myself and be prosperous. <laughs> Throw Tony Robbins in the trash. Mm -hmm. Okay? He is appealing to the flesh. Um, if you go, and, and many churches are, aren't they almost exclusively based on the self-help premise? Mm -hmm. Are you struggling with your kids? <laughs> Who is it, right, brother? I got a five-step... DVD with a known psychologist. We're going to show it in Sunday school. Oh, we're not going to read the Bible. That's for the pastor. We're going to watch this video on, on how hellish these kids are and five steps you'll whoop their butts into order. And then we'll talk about the movie, the video, for 10 minutes. It's a 30-minute video. We'll talk for 10 and we're out of here with coffee. The church today is therapeutic self-help. Where is justification by faith? Self-improvement. Oh, yeah, I need to be a better husband. I'd like to go to a men's retreat. What I'd like is a men's retreat to help me be a better father and husband. That's what I really need. Well, guess what? You'll go to that retreat. You'll take your notes. You'll cry at the prayer time. I want to be a better father. <laughs> and then you'll go right back to doing the same things you did before you came to the retreat. Have, have we, has anyone else besides me been there? <laughs> But I cried so much, I never cried as much as I did at that retreat. Men we were hugging, men were hugging each other. I think you get my point. Uh, how come I'm still doing the same thing today? How many people remember promise keepers? Oh, oh what a great work of God that was. Should have been called promise breakers. <laughs> promise breakers should, would be the actual name, but nobody would come to promise breakers, right? <laughs> you, you couldn't bring, you couldn't make some money. Promise, they were going to sell the promise keeper t-shirt. Promise keeper study kit. Okay? <laughs> Promise breakers. Was there any, what did it produce? It produced more self-righteousness. Now, isn't it interesting? The people there, their hands are up. And, 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 and look, I'm not saying that there wasn't any benefit. There were mm -hmm. preachers of grace that would stand up and so forth. <clears throat> and certainly, I would have taken an opportunity to preach there. But the whole premise of it is, you've got to improve yourself. You've got to work on yourself instead of saying, I'm justified. My foundation is, I am justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And my righteousness is not from my performance as a husband or father or, or pastor or any of that stuff. My righteousness is Christ himself. Um, and you will, you'll go to the five-step programs. I think I've, I've beaten that horse now. So now let's close here. What does it look like to be like Abraham in relationship to our justification to be strong in faith. <clears throat> we will take the promise of God that you're justified by faith and we will stick to it. We will, we will observe that promise. It will be a single-minded focus that Jesus Christ is my righteousness right now. He is my righteousness. And though I just blew up at my kids, and I'm being transparent here, I just blew up at my kids again, and I prayed to God again to help me not to do that. I did it anyway. My righteousness is Jesus Christ. Okay? Let that be in the forefront of our thinking. It's transformational. We're going to be strong in, in faith. We're going to have the breastplate on. So we consider fully God's promises. Jeremiah 23, 6. A name for God. Jehovah Sidkena. Jehovah Sidkena. Any takers what that is? Jehovah Sidkena. Jehovah our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. The great I am is this guy's righteousness. Jehovah Zidkeah. Jehovah my righteousness. He is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. Um, our justification of, the, of us as ungodly is by faith. By faith. Number two, give glory to God. 
Okay, it's God that justifies. Let's glorify God. What does that look like in a practical realm? We, we share with people the gospel. We share with people that we, we don't put up a facade of perfection. We don't put up a facade of, of Christianity. You know, uh, you know, Sunday church face. We don't go to work with Sunday church face on. It gets really tiring at work, I think, after a while. I know I couldn't keep up Sunday church face at work all the time. <laughs> oh, how are you? Oh, you, you want me to work an extra two hours tonight? Well, bless the Lord. That's it. <laughs> uh, I just bless your holy name, your your name. <laughs> um, I didn't always feel like uh, having a smiley face on. Um. Now I'm not saying that you can't have joy and serve your your employer. I'm saying though, let's give glory to God for the work that He does. I, I'm justified by faith, and that brings it produces a joy and a reality. I can serve in any given circumstance. I can be me. I can be me with my, yeah. my stumbling and my falling. I don't have to make excuses and, and try and cover up for this and that. And it liberates me, right? It liberates us. I'm justified by Christ, not by my behavior. And let me tell you about Jesus. Let's don't talk about me. Let's talk about Jesus, right? Let's give him glory. And then be fully persuaded, okay? Completely assured, convinced uh, you've, you've proven, it's overcome. You, you, I realize now my justification is by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, God's promise of justification is real. I am fully persuaded of it. It is God's performance of justification, not my own, okay, that uh, is, is the shield, the breastplate of righteousness that I have on. And folks, when, when your righteousness is totally detached from you or your performance, and it's exclusively placed on Jesus Christ. He is your righteousness. Satan has no weapon formed against that breastplate. He cannot penetrate that breastplate, and your heart will be protected from the condemnation, the lies, and the slander of the wicked one because he cannot penetrate. He cannot overcome the breastplate of righteousness. All he can do is get you to put it down. And that is the struggle that we face to, to the spiritual warfare, to put on that breastplate of the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself in a conscious day-to-day -day fashion. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, like, like Abraham. Uh, he was fully persuaded that what you said, you were able to perform. May we be fully persuaded like Abraham that what you've promised, what you've said, that you have justified us, even though we are in a state of sin, you call those things which are not as though they were because you are Almighty God. And you called Abraham the father of many nations when his body was emaciated. And yet, Lord, we see today the testimony of your faithfulness in the nation of Israel. And Father, not only today in the year 2021, but into eternity, the number of Israelites will be more numerous numerous. Uh, then the ability, it will be easier to count the stars in heaven than it is to count the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We thank you, God, that we are by faith the sons and daughters of Abraham. We have believed God. Abraham believed God, and we have believed God. And so, Lord, our faith is reckoned as righteousness by you. Father, please help us not to just amen that message of church, but in the heat of spiritual battle when we leave here, God, may we recognize in victory, that our righteousness is from you. Jehovah Sidkena. Jehovah, our righteousness. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Seal them to our heart, we pray in Jesus' name.